Hello, everyone. Welcome, welcome. We are still waiting for my co-panelist to come and join us, but I didn't want to keep you guys waiting, so I thought I would come on and say hi. What an incredible turnout. This webinar has spots for only 500 of you, and within seconds, we went all the way up to 500 participants. So I am honored that you wanted to spend your Tuesday night with me, and I accept the challenge to try to deliver a really fun and interesting course for you tonight. I am going to go ahead and share the screen. Well, you guys, I'm uh, completely touched and honored and excited to have you here for a new series that we're launching for uh, the U.S. Embassy, specifically for the ACCA. This is the American Cultural Center in Algeria run out of the U.S. Embassy. And this is the second series we're doing. The first series that we did was Business English last fall. And this series is called English for Specific Purposes, ESP. And this is our very first week. Welcome. Let me introduce myself. For those of you who I don't know, who don't know me, my name is Ariella, Ariella Knight. I am the founder and CEO of the American Institute, which is an English school and a cultural exchange center based in Algiers, founded just a few years ago. I was born in Boston, Massachusetts. Does anyone know what region Boston is in? What part of the United States? I'm looking at the discussion. East, North, very good. Someone said East, someone said North. We call the region Northeast, the Northeast United States, all the way at the very top. Then I went out to Colorado College, which is in the opposite direction, in the Southwest, in the mountains. And then I went all the way back East, but this time in the middle between North and South to Georgetown University in Washington, DC. So I have lived in many places in the United States, which I think many of you know is a big country. And then in 2018, I moved to Algeria. I, uh, my background professionally is as a project manager, program manager, a business consultant, and then also an English teacher. So I moved to Algeria as an English teacher. I taught in a local university in Algiers for one year, and then I decided to stay and open the American Institute, as, as I said, an English school and cultural center. We are so, so privileged to do these partnerships with the US Embassy, where I get to come and speak to all of you guys about a topic in English that is interesting for us and we hope very useful for you. Okay, so today we're going to talk not just about our topic, which is tourism, but we're also going to do an introduction to all of the classes, okay? So this is a bit of an overview class since it's the very first one. So this is a series, as I mentioned, called English for Specific Purposes. The acronym that we use is ESP. We will be teaching this every Tuesday evening, 6.30 to 8 p.m. Okay, it's 10 weeks long, so that means we have 10 sessions. Every session is completely free to attend. There are 500 spots, as I mentioned, and I can't believe it, but we're full today. We have 500 of you sitting and listening right now. Because we have so many people signing up, we also record and post these sessions on YouTube afterwards. So if you miss a session, you can still watch it after. This is the program. Week one, this is where we are, brand new week one. Introduction to the class, introduction to ESP, and then English for Tourism. The second half of the class, we will focus on English for Tourism. However, next week, we have another class that is completely English for Tourism. We'll spend the entire hour and a half just focused on this. Then weeks three and four, we have another shared topic, a big topic. We needed two weeks for it. 
English for Health and Medicine. I know I get so many questions about medical English and how to learn English specifically for medical fields. And I'm excited to be devoting two full weeks to this. Then we have English for Media, news articles, news vocabulary, things like this. And then we have English for Social Media, which I hope some of you are also interested in social media and how to talk about followers and collaborations and hashtags, things like this. Then we have English for humor. Uh, this is how to use English perhaps uh, as a comedian or, or how to use humor in a fun way in English. English for beauty, uh, that will probably be beauty and fashion for those working in the beauty or fashion fields or people who are just very interested in these topics. And then week nine, we have English for cooking, cooking measurements, uh, different recipes, the vocabulary you need, all of it. The very last week is TBD. It means topic to be decided. This is because I want your input and your suggestions about what topic we did not include that you really, really wanna learn about. So we have our program set for nine weeks and we have the 10th week open, okay? So start thinking about that even now about different kinds of topics that you'd love to get a specific English class on. All right. Moving on. Oh, and I'd like to say welcome to my co-panelist, Marwa. Marwa will be here mostly silent, but helping with admin. Okay, so if people aren't following the rules, Marwa might help me remove someone, which I hope doesn't happen. She'll help call on you if you raise your hand. So everyone can say hi, hello to Marwa, the Black Square, joining us as my tech support and admin. As a reminder, this is a B2 level class. That means that we are speaking uh, at an advanced intermediate level of English. We welcome anyone. So if you're in this class and you don't have a B2 level, that's completely fine. But I will not be slowing down any more than this. In fact, I might be speeding up and the level may be hard for you. If I get requests, can you slow down? Can you explain? I may say to you, Watch the recording later because we really want to keep the focus here on the learning of vocabulary and not on English lower than the B2 level. Okay. A little bit about how the class will run. Every week we have a different topic, which you saw. Classes will be a combination of specialized vocabulary, skill development, and guest interviews. This week we don't have a guest because it's our very first week. But after this, most weeks we will actually have a guest with us who we will interview and learn about their profession and their work in that specific field. At specific points in the class, I will ask you questions and we really encourage you to participate. You can participate via uh, the chat, which you're already doing and I love, that's great. I try to keep an eye on it. Um, or sometimes you can raise your hand and you can speak on the mic. Of course, not everyone's gonna get to speak. There's a lot of you here, but a, a lucky few will get to speak on mic and share their experiences with us. So we try to have participation in every, uh, in every class. We also have some polls, okay? So at different times, we'll be asking for your opinion or your experiences. Okay, to get the most out of this class, you'll see I like dog photos. Here is the first one. So number one, attend the sessions that interest you. So make sure to check out the US Embassy Instagram page because they will, and Facebook page, because they will be uh, posting every week the different topics. So if you didn't memorize the different weeks and the topics, you don't need to memorize it. Just make sure you check the Instagram and Facebook page, uh, which will announce the topic and the guest speaker. Come with questions. If you know what the topic is, it's even better because you can prepare your questions for me and get the most out of being one of the lucky few to be here live. Take advantage of being here with me to ask all the questions you might have. And then use the chat. 
submit those questions. I will try my best to respond. I can't promise I'll respond to all of them, but I do my best to keep these sessions as interactive as possible. And then when asked, raise the hand to participate with the mic. It's gonna be the little indicator that looks like a hand. Okay, it's, I, I forget what it's called in, on the French Zoom, but it should say something like, put your hand up or levez la main, okay? And then we will call you to participate on mic only at specific moments, okay? If your hand is up right now, it's not a moment when you can speak, you might as well put it back down. And then also something I really recommend to get the most out of the class, consider cultural questions. English for Special Purposes is not just a language class. It is not just a linguistic class. It is also focused on cultural elements that interact with language in different contexts, okay? So don't be afraid to bring me your cultural questions as well as your language ones. Okay, we're still doing some of the details of the class. How to use the chat. Uh, number one, respond to the exercises. Number two, ask questions related to the topic. Encourage each other. I might not see everything because I'm teaching, I'm looking at my slides, but you guys are really encouraged to interact with each other while you're, while you're learning, while you're here. So the chat is for you and it's for me to jump in and see kind of how people are reacting and what kinds of questions you have. Next, there's a Q&A feature. Uh, you'll see it usually at the top of your screen. If you have French Zoom, it will say Q and R, um, but you can officially submit a question there. For me, it's the same. I try to check the chat. I try to check the Q&A. There's no one that's better than another. I'll do my best to get to questions as they come up and I'll look at both. I will tell you two answers. Uh, that we get a lot, this question, these two questions we get a lot of. So I started putting them right at the beginning of the presentation. Number one, there is no certificate for this class. The main reason for this is we have no record of who attends. You may join for 10 minutes, you may join for the full hour and a half, you may come one week, you may come, you may not come the next week. So we do not have a certificate for the class, okay? but I hope you still find it extremely valuable even without a certification. Number two, the class is recorded and will be posted on YouTube. It will be posted in the US Embassy's YouTube page as well as the YouTube page for the American Institute. And then how to participate with Mike, which I've already explained. You can participate via audio, raise your hand, we'll let you unmute and you can join us. Class rules, again, I love dogs. I don't know why, but I love pictures of dogs wearing human items like glasses. So this is the face of a dog telling you the rules. Number one, the number one rule is respect. We need respect and we need civility, okay? This means when you're speaking with each other in the chat or you're speaking with me, we keep it a classroom environment where we're focused on learning. This includes being nice to each other, being nice and being kind. Usually this is not a problem and we have a super great learning environment even through the chats. No profanity, okay? Profanity means swearing, inappropriate words. Also no discussion of irrelevant topics. We are here to learn the topic of the day and that's what we'll focus on. And the last rule is help create a fun and positive learning environment. Cheer each other on, support each other, say hi, welcome each other. Uh, if we do see anything in the chat that we don't love, we might boot you out. But I can tell you the last time we did this series, we had, I think only one person got removed in eight weeks. So I'm excited to see more of that energy, more of that positivity in this series too. More dogs, are we all good? So this is an example of the time that I would pause and I'll check the chat and I'll check the questions. So you see, there are moments when I will take a pause and I'll actually check and see what people are saying. Someone said, where is Khaled? Khaled is at the US embassy, but not only for a few more days. Okay, are those your dogs? No, they are not my dogs. I actually, I saw earlier someone said, why not cats? I did look for cat photos because I know cats are more popular in Algeria. But they don't, I didn't find as good expressions. Dogs, they have these very silly expressions. 
but I'm, I'm open to being sent some good cat photos and I can start to, to integrate. <laughs> yes, okay, I see. No one can disagree with those rules. Thank you, Huda. Do we have uh, to register every week, Miriam? Very good question. You do not need to register every week. The link is the same every week and you should get an email reminder an hour before the class every week. So you have officially registered for the full series. You do not need to re-register, but you should still plan to come early if you wanna get your seat. Okay, sunshine, I am in Algeria. I am in Algeria right now. Someone loves turtles. Oh my gosh, you guys. Okay, this is great. Lots of questions. I'll check the Q&A. Okay, I see a lot of questions about the certification. As mentioned, we don't have certificates. Okay. All right, guys, let's get started. Enough of this. We spent maybe about 15 minutes going over the rules of the class. It is time to talk about ESP. Let's start the series of ESP. So this is the agenda. I'm very organized. I will always have an agenda in the classes. First of all, we have two parts to this class. We have welcome to the class section and then tourism English because tourism English is our topic today. So we've already done number one in welcome to the class, which is overview of the rules and the curriculum. Now we're gonna talk about what is ESP and why does it matter? After that, you'll see under tourism English, we have a vocabulary section, we have a skill section, and we'll end with an idiom. I have a question for you. I saw someone ask this earlier, but I'm actually gonna start by asking you, what is English for specific purposes? If you know, put the answer. If you don't know, put a guess. What do you think it means? English for special purposes. Okay, ESP are designed for specific learners as workers. Okay, specific topic. Okay, someone says it's in the name. Exactly. In some ways, I'm asking you to explain a somewhat obvious name, but try your best. Uh, specific themes. It means vocabulary used for specific topics. Okay, for specific workers, specific reasons, specific, specific, specific vocabulary. Okay. A precise topic. Very good. Okay. Words for a topic, the jargon we use in professional fields. I like this word jargon talking about a specific topic. Oh my gosh, you guys are going too fast. I can't even read them specific sector. Okay. Learning English for a specific domain. These are all good words, sector, domain, jargon, uh, specific, specific. Yes, I, I'm just repeating specific. Here is my answer. ESP is a specific genre of English for students with specific goals. Okay, so it encompasses two things. It is both a, I'm trying to find a synonym for a specific, an exact area that you're learning about, but to meet goals related to this, okay? It focuses on developing communicative skills and usage of English in specific fields, okay? This is because when people come to ESP, they already have a foundation in basic English. They've already learned the grammar, they've learned basic vocabulary, and they want to learn or they want to use the English they have in a field relevant to their interests. For that reason, ESP is generally a communicative based field. You're learning to use your English in a different uh, topic. Usually it is oriented to meet professional goals or it's, or it's focused on a specific professional setting, which you saw in our list. We have for humor, that could be for a future comedian. We have for a beauty, that could be for a stylist. We have for cooking, that could be for a chef. So it can be personal interest, but almost all of them can also be for professional purposes. Okay, question two, what are the benefits of learning ESP? What are the benefits? Again, you might say it's kind of obvious. Well, okay then, if it's obvious, tell me. 
practicing your English, amazing. This is an amazing benefit to any type of English class to get more grammar, to enrich vocabulary, to be able to uh, communicate, easy communication, working in the international spheres, very good. Allowing learners to master skills. I really love the word mastery, okay? Taking it from one level into a much more sophisticated level, conversation, to be professional in your domain, enrich vocabulary for tourism, to be a native speaker. Okay, very good. Conversation. I think everything has been mentioned that I have. You guys are good. So I have three benefits to ESP. Number one is professional development. So ESP gives students the required practical skills and specific vocabulary to enter that field in English. So even if you have really good English, in order to enter a new job, you need to demonstrate that you have the English for that job. You may have really high level of English because you play video games every week, you talk to your friends, you're chatting on Discord, then you do uh, an interview to be a receptionist at a hotel. And they start asking you questions about hotels with vocabulary you've never encountered, okay? It's a really critical part of your professional development to master vocabulary related to your fields. Number two, a huge benefit, and I love that you guys mentioned this, is increased communication practice. So ESP is based on using the English you already know, just in a new context. So it's a great opportunity to practice your communication. It's a really good exercise, no matter what language you're learning, to try to take that language into a foreign context. See how well you do. It's not just about the vocabulary, it's also about the level of politeness, the level of formality, any sort of cultural elements that are important. Okay, it's an amazing practice for your communication skills in English. Next is increased motivation. So learning English in a context that interests you will continue to motivate you to learn and master English. So when you see the usage of your English, you will be more motivated to keep improving it. If you are a pilot and you keep taking English classes that have you focused on uh, accounting vocabulary, submitting financial reports, Maybe you start to fall asleep. You say English is boring. This isn't useful to me. Then you take an English for aviation class and you understand instantly, oh, I need these words. I need this when I travel through another city. I heard someone say that and I didn't understand what it meant. Okay, so it's a really useful tool to keep you motivated in your learning if you're learning about the areas that interest you. Okay? <laughs> Come on, does nobody like my dogs? I loved this talk. <laughs> okay, so now we're going on to tourism and travel. We have talked all about what is ESP. I've given you my big speech for why I think everyone should value ESP. In fact, many of you are already doing ESP, meaning English for specific purposes, um, out of necessity. You're doing it when you do video games. You're, you're, you're using it or you're learning it when you're watching YouTube videos that interest you. Maybe it's adventure sport YouTube videos, people jumping out of planes. So you learn that vocabulary. That is considered ESP. It's English really specific to that activity. So I hope you're feeling like you understand exactly why ESP is very useful to you and why we put together the class specifically for ESP. So now we're going to go on to tourism and travel. I love that someone just said it's a dog's overdose. That just accurately describes me. Always, I want a dog's overdose. Okay, guys, before we continue, I have a poll for you, okay? I have a poll and I'm gonna try to launch it. You are going to have, I think, 30 seconds. Ah, I should say, I know we have some international participants, which I welcome, welcome everyone from outside of Algeria but the polls in the class are targeted to Algerians. Everyone can participate, but you'll notice that it's Algeria specific. Okay. It should be appearing on your screen. 
you have, uh, I'm going to say, one minute to answer this poll. The question is, have you been a tourist before in Algeria? Okay, so if you're Algerian, this means national tourism within the Algerian territory. Have you ever traveled as a tourist? You can say, yes, I have traveled as a tourist in Algeria, or no, I haven't traveled as a tourist in Algeria, and I'm not sure, which is okay because we're gonna go over definitions soon. 20 more seconds to answer the poll. Wow, you guys are good, actually. We have over 370 people who have answered. I like this. We have an active group. Let's just get to 400. I'm, that's all I want. 400. Okay. Almost everyone responded. So I'm going to tell you guys, let's put an end to it. So now you should be able to see the results as well. So 72% of this group tonight has traveled as a tourist. Okay. Maybe it's someone in Oran has traveled to Constantine. Maybe it's someone in Blida has traveled to Algiers. Okay. 22%, that's about one fifth, have not traveled as tourists in Algeria. They have not left their home area to travel. And about 6% aren't sure. Okay, good. And then we're gonna go to poll number two. It should be on your screen right now. Okay, it's live. Let's see if we can get to 400 again. This question is, have you ever been a tourist outside of Algeria? These questions are what I call um, scene setting. They just help me and they help you understand who's with us. When we're talking about tourism, how many people have had that experience of tourism um, that they can share? How many people have uh, experienced tourism as a national, so within their own country, and how many people have experienced tourism actually as an international traveler outside of their country. Okay, I see. Wow, we already have over 400. Oh my gosh, 425. And I'm going to give it, and we still have 10 more seconds. Guys, you're showing, uh, you're showing the business English class what it's, how to do it. This is a good group. All right. I think everyone should be able to see the results. So 50%, 50% have been a tourist outside of Algeria. So maybe traveling Algeria to France, traveling to Morocco, to Tunisia, and a similar 50, 48% have not yet traveled as a tourist outside of the country. 2% are not sure. I think you can see the results. Oh, I don't know if I shared it before. Okay. All right. Thank you for participating in the polls. Oh my gosh. And I see in the chat, everyone saying where they traveled. Very cool. I should say right now that whether you've traveled or not, it does not affect your ability to participate. It just helps us understand uh, who we are in the room with. Okay. Because we're going to ask for people's experiences and feedback later. I have a question for you guys. I just made you do a poll related to tourism, but at no point did we define tourism. I wanna see, what is tourism? How would you define tourism? Tell me in the chat, what is tourism? Going to other countries, traveling, holidays, leaving your country for fun, outside of your home area, discovering new places, cultural exchange, spending time away. It's the act of visiting other places, discovering a new country, a new culture, leaving your country, fun, adventure, beautiful cities. Yes, we have a lot of positive, uh, positive associations with tourism. This idea that you go for beauty, for fun, for leisure, what we call leisure. In reality, tourism, the definition of tourism is actually not very detailed. This is the definition we have. Tourism is the act of traveling 
for business or leisure purposes to a location away from your hometown or usual area. So I saw some of you answered in the chat, tourism is leaving where you're from for another location. That's exactly accurate. Tourism just means going outside of your home area, okay? Or outside of somewhere, it may be, you know, visiting your grandmother in another city. This is not tourism. This is somewhere you often go, you go and you stay home with family, okay? But outside of a usual area and outside of your hometown. Every year, over 1 billion people engage in tourism. 1 billion. How many people are there now? Seven? How many of us are on planet Earth? This is one seventh of the population is engaging in tourism every year. I believe, and I, I hope we have people here who work in the tourist industry who can speak to this, but this number I imagine is only growing. The demand for uh, new opportunities for adventure, for discovery is always high. And therefore the demand for people to work in tourism is also always high. So let's talk about that. Today's topic is tourism English. How do you think tourism English is different from regular English? Why do we even need to learn tourism English? What would be different about it than regular English? I can tell you right now, it is different, but tell me how, how is it different? Okay, different vocabulary. Yeah, technical words, it has a specific vocabulary. Someone says about uh, hotels. I saw someone say to interact with foreigners, okay. Mm hmm different culture, different terminology, the accent. Someone says, I think it has uh, more specific keywords, specific jargon. Ooh, someone said polite English. I think it was a Jamel, very good. I was hoping someone would speak to that. Okay, a couple people are saying it's the same. Well, I have to tell you, I do not believe it's the same. We have a whole lesson today designed to tell you exactly what is unique about it. Um, but it's certainly not, it's not crazy different. It's a lot of terms that you might know already from watching movies, or you might have heard, but once you've memorized them and you understand a little bit about the culture, I'm sure everyone here will be able to master tourism English. Okay, so tourism English is two things. Number one, simpler and more direct, okay? This is because you encounter many non-native English speakers when you are either a tourist or working in tourism. So when you encounter someone who doesn't speak English as a first language, the vocabulary, the grammatical structures are not as complex. Okay, because you're really trying to find a way to communicate. It could be that you meet someone from Mexico who speaks English at a beginner, advanced beginner level. If you are operating a restaurant, and let's say you're in Wajaran running a restaurant, this Mexican uh, family comes in, you need to be able to use a very simple level of English in order to communicate with your clients. Okay, this is an example of how tourism English can be different than regular English or the adjustments that you have to make when you're working in tourism. The second that I did see is more polite. This is because tourism English is mostly used in what we call the hospitality industry. The hospitality industry is an industry that mostly is hotels and restaurants. It's places that service, they provide a service to others um, and they are often providing it in a very polite, formal setting, okay? Or they should be providing it in a polite and formal setting. So these are the two things that I want you to focus on when you're talking about uh, tourism English. It's somewhat simpler, therefore more direct, and it is also more polite. So now I'm actually going to invite you guys to come on mic. This is the first time we're gonna welcome, I'm gonna say let's maybe take three people on the microphone. 
Before you raise your hand, let me explain the question. So I am inviting people who have used English when they traveled. So when you are a tourist, if you used English, then I welcome you to answer the question. Or people who have used tourism English for work. So maybe you welcomed someone at your restaurant or at your hotel or at your travel agency in English. And my question for you, if either of these describe you, my question is, what do you notice about tourism English that's different than regular English? Do you agree with me? Did you find it to be simpler? Did you find it to be more polite? I want to hear some stories. Uh, as a reminder, when you come on mic, please try to keep your remarks brief, just about one minute, because we have a lot of people who want to participate. Okay, Marwa, let's see how we can invite people up. I see 33 hands up. Oh my gosh. So I believe Marwa, you just pick one and you click allow to speak. Do you see what I see? Um, I don't have the allow to speak here. Well, maybe only I have this. Okay, let me try it on my end. Okay, let's, let's see. Okay, I'm going to pick completely randomly. Hafida Zerigui. Or Zerigui. Can you hear us? You'll have to unmute yourself. Are you there, Hafida? We? Uh, oui. uh, yes. Hi, welcome. So, Hafida, tell me, have you ever? Have you ever had to use tourism English? Yes, in France. Okay, and what was your experience? Uh, that it was uh, difficult because I'm not good in English. Okay. But uh, uh, in a laborat laboratory, uh, mm -hmm. There are many people speak English, so um, um, uh, I uh, I am uh, learning. I decide to learning English for this. Mm -hmm. Okay, very nice. Well, thank you so thank you so much, Hafida. Thank you for being our first volunteer. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, I'm going to call up next person. Bye. Bye. Okay. That worked. Okay, we're gonna call the next person totally at random. I have Noel Bernou. Hi, Noel. Can you hear us? I think you'll have to take yourself off mute. Oh my gosh, everyone is raising their hands. Noelle, are you there? Yes. Hi, welcome. Hi. Noelle, tell us, have you ever used tourism English before? Yes, uh, I have used uh, English tourism before when uh, traveling to Belgium, as they speak only Dutch and not uh, French. Okay. And uh, yes, and also in Switzerland. It was a bit difficult to, to speak English with the non-native speaker. Interesting. What part of it was difficult for you? It's to find the right word and mm -hmm. uh, try to explain myself to people who speak Dutch and uh, speak uh, other language, not, uh, not specifically English. Yes, definitely. They have a different accent. Yes. They're maybe using different different words than, than you choose in English and you're using different words exactly. that they don't choose in English. Okay. All right, very exactly. cool. Thank you so much, Noelle. Thank you're you. Welcome. I'm gonna call up the next person. You're welcome. Okay, bye. bye. 
All right, who's coming up next? Who's coming up next? Let's go to the top of the alphabet and take an A. I have Esma Shaikh. Shaikh? Shaikh. I think she just took her hand down. Oh no, I didn't. Oh no. You guys are putting your hands up so fast. It's moving the, it's moving everyone around. I've lost Esma. Oh no. Okay, Esma, you're here. Welcome. I think you'll have to unmute yourself to join. Can you hear us? Okay, I'm not sure if Asma is there. So let's go for Ilyas. Ilyas Kesri, can you hear us? We're just going to do two more. Hmm. Yeah, I think you might have to unmute or it could be a connection. Sometimes people don't have a connection. They don't have a good enough connection, I mean. All right, we'll try again. Mina. Mina Anna. Hi, Mina, are you there? Are you guys nervous? Do you want to speak and then you're nervous? <laughs> Let's try. Oh, is, Mina, is that you? Oh, I think it's a connection problem. I think it's a connection problem. Okay. We're gonna try one more. We're gonna try one more, you guys. This is a this is a sad, a sad moment. Let's try Rafiq. Rafiq Ben Khadam. Tell me you have good connection, Rafiq. No. <laughs> no. Well, we had, a, we had two good ones in the beginning. We heard some good testimonials about being a tourist abroad. I especially appreciated, I mean, I heard uh, some people going abroad and being very nervous about their own level. And uh, someone else saying, when you're talking to someone from who's also non-native and they don't have the same language base as you, it can be really hard to find similarities. Okay, guys, I can't, I don't want to just keep picking people and nobody can talk. So I think we're just going to keep going. I see 92 hands up, but everyone I choose is not, is not, doesn't have a connection. Okay, I see some of you in the chat telling me you have a good connection. We're going to go for the, the loudest chat people. I saw someone named Smain, are you still there, Smain? You promised me you had a good connection. How do I get you up here? Okay, Smain, you're on. You're my last. Yes. Okay. Good morning. Yeah. <laughs> connection. Good afternoon. How are you? Fine, thanks. And you? <laughs> I'm doing well. All right. So you're here to make up for everyone else who couldn't talk. Tell exactly. us what is your what is your experience of tourism English? Uh, yes, I uh, I have uh, yes I uh, I have the opportunity to travel the many country, but I must to to speak uh, uh, to speak uh, English tourist. Yes, and. Uh, uh, yes, the ask uh, when I visit, uh, for example, uh, uh, actually I am in uh, in the UK, okay. <laughs> and I try to uh, to practice my English. 
and yeah. maybe it's uh, it's more it's very complicated in in UK, but mm -hmm. it's uh, the action, it's a specific action. <laughs> it's okay. the same difference uh, between uh, the action, American action, and um, the UK action. <laughs> Absolutely. And even depending where you are in the UK, the accent changes a lot. Exactly, yes. Okay. Are you finding that tourism English is more polite for you? Or do you feel uh, like it? Yeah, yes, yes, it's more polite. For example, uh, one, uh, one, for example, I, um, I prefer the tourism England. Uh, mm -hmm. But it's yes, the, the the person it's very kindly, very uh, yes. It's uh, I can't to to speak all uh, all person when we have the question. The all person it smile and you can't to help you. Okay. Uh, yes, for example, when you go in France, for example, or to Paris, mm -hmm. it's very complicated. Uh, the, the person it's not uh, not uh, <laughs> not smile. It's it's very difficult. Mm. Yes. Yeah, okay. Thank you, Smain. Yes, I think that's absolutely true that we have different expectations when it comes to politeness in English. Yeah, this is exactly. True. exactly. Awesome. Thank you for sharing that. Thanks for coming on and for being honest about a good connection. I saw you in the chat and you were not lying. I <laughs> okay, it. thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> All right, guys. Well, we'll have some other times to join in later, um, but I hope when we do, you guys can take your hands down now, put those hands back up, and we will hope to find, uh, hear some more personal stories later and actually have some good discussions and exercises. Okay, so we're still in the part where we're talking about kind of what is tourism English? How is it different? For me, it's very important. It's not just a matter of learning vocabulary. It's a matter of understanding why do I need to know this and how is it different? Okay, this, I will always have this at the beginning of the conversation when we get to English or humor. Why is it different? What do I need to think about when I'm in this context? So for tourism, you definitely need to think about uh, more polite and simpler language. So the first thing we're going to do, as I told you, we're going to do one part vocabulary, one part skill building. We're starting with vocabulary. So for this, I'd love for you to get a piece of paper. We are doing co-locations. If you have a piece of paper and a pen or pencil near you, uh, that would be best for the exercise that happens. I just looked down at the chat and Tariq says, when you speak tourism English, you will use hand gestures more. I love this point because it's absolutely true that when you're communicating in a situation that is more challenging, which speaking to someone with a different language base than you from a different culture, you will definitely find yourself using your hands more to help with the communication. Okay, but I'm getting distracted in the chat. Piece of paper, pen or pencil, please. So what is a collocation? You may be asking me, what is this fancy term? Okay, collocation literally just means a grouping of words, okay? But this grouping or this group is a common grouping, okay? So tourism English collocations are common combinations of words. So we always use this verb with this noun, for example. If you substitute one word for a synonym, instead of saying uh, eat, you say consume, for example. They're sort of synonyms. Uh, he ate a sandwich, he consumed a sandwich. In a collocation, even if the grammar is okay, it will not sound correct because these are very common groupings. So when I talk about vocabulary to learn for certain areas, a lot of what I want you to learn is not just single words, but collocations. I want you to learn groupings of words that are very commonly used. You'll see what I mean in one second. So tourism English collocations used correctly can make all the difference, okay? This can make you sound very, very fluent. And when you see the collocations we're gonna work on in the next slide, they're not high level English, but it's just a matter of knowing the grouping. 
I'm not sure. You'll have to tell me if the ones I chose were really easy or really hard. I couldn't decide when I was putting it together if some of them are really obvious or actually make a lot of sense. Oh, before we get to the, sl to the slide on what the collocations are, I just want to talk to you about vocabulary in two sections. When we say tourism vocabulary, we are talking both vocabulary for tourists, so that's airport, travel, hotel, booking a tour, booking a hotel, booking a flight, you are the tourist, and vocabulary for people who work in tourism. So they are not themselves the tourists, they are the hotel staff, they are the restaurant workers, they are the tour guide company, the travel agency. Tourism vocabulary is for both of these groups. It's for any person who travels as a tourist and it's for people who interact with tourists. Okay, here's the exercise on co-location. We have two circles, a yellow circle and a pink circle. I want you to tell me how many combinations how many collocations or groupings you can find from one word in the yellow with one word in the pink, okay? So in yellow, you have the word, oh, oh no, it's missing. <laughs> go, somehow the word go has been deleted. You guys, I have to add it back. If we don't have go, we're missing a lot of really good ones. Don't go anywhere. Think about co-locations. Everybody take a quick pause while I add the word go back into the slide because that is also my best example. Oh, it was just hiding, it was too low. Okay, technical difficulties. Don't go anywhere. Yes, we're back. I'm doing that. Here we are. Go. Okay. So you'll see in the yellow circle now, you can see the word go. You need to tell me what word can you put with go that is in the pink circle. And you can use it more than once. You can say, do I say go a guide? Do I say go agent? Do I say go hotel? So try to think every combination you can with go and you tell me the ones that actually work, okay? You can put them in the chat, but I also recommend you write them down because I'm going to ask you how many you found. So I want you to keep track of the uh, co-locations that you find. I want to see how many you can get. I'm going to give you for four minutes. I'm looking at the clock now. And one more. I have a feeling, I knew this would happen. I have a feeling you guys are gonna find some that I missed. As a native English speaker, it doesn't mean I'm a master of everything English and I often forget some myself, but I have a good bunch. Someone says seven, seven, four, five, seven, eight, nine. Someone said, 88. I don't think, I think that was a typo. <laughs> There's definitely not 88. Someone says about 20. Cool. Okay, guys, we're going to go to the answers. So I don't have a fun slide where I go through each thing or I thought about matching them, but instead I'm just going to show you all the co-locations I found and I'm going to go through the list one by one. I will provide an explanation if I think it's unusual, but if I don't provide an explanation and you want to know, I'll keep an eye on the chat and you can ask me, I don't understand, or what does this mean? Okay, this is our vocabulary part of the evening. My goal for this is that you leave with dramatic effect with 
22 new phrases. If they're not new, and maybe even every single one of these, you say, Ariella, I know this, or I understand this, but now you understand that this is a very common collocation. You see these words together in this order. Okay, so let me start with number one as an example. Airport hotel, okay? You can say, Ariella, that's really obvious. It's an airport hotel. What's the collocation? Okay, but we don't say hotel in the airport. I mean, you can if you wanted to, if you want it to be long, but you can also say, I'm staying in the airport hotel. This is a hotel within the airport. You do not leave the airport to go to the hotel. Oftentimes you don't even leave your terminal. There is usually in a big hotel, there's one of them, okay? You can see in the, in the back slide, we had airport. The next thing with airport is airport terminal. Airport terminal, this is the section of the airport that your flight is leaving from. Uh, some airports have terminals with numbers, terminal one, two, three. Others have letters, terminal A, B, C, okay? Did anyone find anything with airport that I did not find? Airport. I see. I see some of you did not understand the exercise. That's okay. That's okay. You can still look at the slides later. Airport luggage. Airport luggage, we would not say that would mean it was the luggage belonging to the airport. The airport is a, is a place. It cannot have luggage. Airport agent, we also do not say. That would be also equally unclear. There are no agents for the airport unless you're talking about a security guard or security agent, but otherwise they are agents with specific airlines. Okay, so I think I got both with airport. So now we're on the second word, which is book. Tell me what you had for book. What is a collocation we can say with book? I see book a guide. Very good, you can book a guide, you can book a hotel, book a tour. Very good. Yes, you can say book a hotel, exactly. I have book a guide and book a tour, but you guys are right. You can say book a hotel. Anything else we can say with book? Book a trip, yes. When you say book a trip, it implies that you have booked a trip that someone has planned. So it means you booked a package. So they plan the flight, the hotel, and maybe some excursions or maybe some events. That's when we say book a trip. Okay, otherwise we book flights, we book hotels, we book tour guides. We do not book deals. You don't book a deal. You get a deal, you don't book a deal. Okay, next we have boost. Tell me, what did you do for boost? Ah, someone said, what does it mean book a guide? So to book a guide means that you're hiring a tour guide but we also use the verb to book. So to book is actually more common in the US and to hire is more common in the UK, but effectively they are synonyms. So it means that you call the, the guide and you say, I would like to reserve you uh, to show me the downtown area, maybe the souk tomorrow at 12 PM. And you go, is it booked? He says, it's booked. So I have booked a guide for tomorrow. Boost, we actually just have one for boost, you guys, boost tourism. Good, I see a lot of you saying boost tourism, very good. To boost means to increase. This is a very classic collocation, meaning that we, we almost always say this, boost tourism. It's much more common than a synonym like increase tourism. If you wanna sound fluent when you're speaking tourism English, you're gonna use that word boost, boost tourism. How do we boost our, our tourist numbers? How do we boost tourism this year? Good. Next we have business. What comes after business? Okay, business trip, good. Yeah, boost sales. We also say this, but I don't think I put sales as an option in my, in my pink circle. Uh, business agent no business tourism yes you can say business tourism certainly business deal you can say business deal business trip that's what i was looking for oh 
oh, I forgot business trip on my own list. Imagine it says business trip, you guys. That's the big one. Business trip. We don't call it a business vacation. We don't call it a business voyage. We don't call it a business flight. We call it a business trip. Basically, every single time. We don't have a business terminal. No. We don't have a business company. No. Um, I don't. Yes. Very good. I'm seeing questions come in in the question and answer and in the in the chat. Okay, uh, check, check. Very easy, check in, check out. You guys got it. Check in, check out. Look at that, number seven, check in, check out. Good. What does it mean to check in? And where do I check in? Who can tell me? Check in. Check-in is not verified. No, no, where do I check in? I don't check in pack a hotel. Thank you. I check into a hotel, okay? Check-in is both a verb and a noun. To check in means I arrive at the hotel and I tell the hotel I have arrived. I say, I made a reservation, I booked a room, my name is Arielle and Knight. They look me up, they go, thank you. They press buttons, toot toot, and they tell me, you have been checked in. Your room will be ready in 10 minutes, please wait. Okay, so to check in is to confirm your arrival with a hotel, that's the verb. The noun is for the same process. We call it a check-in. You'll hear this a lot when you go, or you'll see it a lot even on a, a hotel's website. They say check-in time is 2 p.m. or later, okay? Check-in begins at 2 p.m. All of that is referencing when you are allowed to enter your room to confirm your reservation, okay? Then I see, yes, Anis, when you leave the hotel, you check out. Very good. So it's exactly the opposite. When you finish, you finish your stay, you're returning home, you have your flight in a few hours, you pack your suitcase, you go downstairs and you tell the front desk, I'm checking out. That's exactly the sentence. Hello, I'm checking out. And that's all you need to say. They understand that it means you are telling them you're leaving. Again, they do their computer. Do, 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 do. You know, hotel receptionists, they always are lots of tapping and I never know what they're doing. They check out, okay? And they say, thank you very much. You have been checked out. So what you'll often find on websites is a check-in and a check-out time listed on the website, okay? All right, next. What do we have for culture? Shock. You guys are easy. I mean, sorry, the answer was easy. <laughs> culture shock. That's the only one I thought of. I don't think we have anything that works with culture besides shock. Nothing else for me. Culture camping? No, we don't have culture camping. Okay, culture, tourism, mm, that's a really good question. I don't think so. We would never say just culture tourism. What's interesting is we may say cultural, but not tourism, maybe cultural trip or uh, something more descriptive. Um, what you guys are saying or what you're pointing out is that there is a new kind of tourism emerging that focuses on local villages, on local cultures, and sometimes these are advertised with new phrases like a culture, a voyage of cultural discovery, something like that. But for now, the collocation is culture shock. Okay, eco. What does eco go with? Ecotourism, Seed Ahmed, the first one. Very good. Ecotourism. Uh, what is ecotourism? Does anybody know? Eco hotel? Yeah, they're starting to say eco hotel. Very good. 
ah, Huda, what is culture shock? Okay, we'll return. We'll do culture shock after, but what is ecotourism? It is not economic tourism. That is a very, very common mistake. I'm so happy you guys made that mistake because, thank you, it is ecological tourism. Eco is short for ecological. It stands for environmental, tourism that does not hurt the environment. Sometimes it means you stay in a, in a tent uh, in a forest. Sometimes it means you uh, live in a very local way in a small village without a very nice or fancy hotel. Uh, it's tourism, thank you. Someone said it's tourism that's environmentally friendly. So it refers to everything. It refers to the location, the type of hotel, and the type of excursions. A lot of times when people say ecotourism, they're going um, into a very natural environment. They're visiting, they're doing a safari, or they're going into a jungle, or they're going to a big uh, nature reserve. A lot of these are kind of uh, ecotourism. Eco camping, I don't think we say eco camping because camping is in the woods in the environment, it's inherently ecological, okay? It's not economic, it's ecological. I'm really happy we cleared it up because it's such a common uh, a switch that people make. Okay, culture shock. Thank you to those who pointed out, I did not explain culture shock. Culture shock is when you have a hard time adjusting to a culture that is different than your own. Culture shock, oh, Ryan has given us a whole description. When you travel somewhere where you face things that are so different from what you're used to. I agree. It can be a sense of sadness. It can be a sense of loneliness and it's not um, tangible. You just don't feel comfortable. You miss home, you miss cooking at home. You can't have the same vegetables around you. Sometimes I still feel not culture shock. It's usually at the beginning of a trip, but sometimes I feel a little bit of homesickness, missing the things at home. So that's culture shock. And it's very common when you travel to a culture extremely different from your own. So a culture that might have um, really different food. Imagine you're used to eating a lot of meat. You eat a lot of red meat, and then you travel to India and it's vegetarian and you have a hard time adjusting and you don't find a way you're not comfortable there. Okay, you feel sad, you miss home. This can be a culture shock. Okay. All right, so we have ecotourism. First, what is happening with first? First trip, first leg. First class, yes, but I didn't give class as an option. First leg. First leg, first leg, not first season, not first away, not first trip. Nope, 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 not first vacation. The only one that I would consider a co-location, meaning it's a very specific phrase, a very specific grouping of words is first leg. What does it mean, first leg? Who can tell me? Hiba, first leg means the first flight of a multi-flight trip. Very good, Hiba, that's perfect. So imagine I'm traveling to, where am I going? Where should I go? Someone give me a destination. Mali. Okay, I'm traveling to Mali. I want to go to Bamako. But the cheapest flight goes to Paris and then Bamako. And I say, you know what? I need the cheapest flight. I'm going to pick this one. The first leg is Algiers to Paris. That first flight of a multi-flight trip, we call it the first leg. The second leg is Paris to Bamako, okay? That first flight in a, a journey that has many flights, we call first leg. Tell me, go. What do we find with go? I found three. Go on holiday, go camping. Very good. Go sightseeing. I think you guys got all three right away. <laughs> go away. So go away is an example of a grouping of words. That's not a co-location. There's nothing special about it. It's not unique to any uh, specific theme. Go sightseeing is tours in English. Go away, I can use anytime, anywhere that I need to tell someone to go away. 
Yeah, exactly. So go on, go out. These are not what I'm looking for. Go on holiday. Very good. Go on holiday. I think you guys got it. I have the three. Go camping, go on holiday, go sightseeing. Those are the three that I have. Do we need to explain any of them? What does it mean go sightseeing? I feel like you guys are all just telling me, go away, go away, go away. <laughs> I'm just joking, I'm joking. Go sightseeing. What does it mean go sightseeing? Oh, someone says to visit the ruins, to look around the city, visit the monuments. Yes, sightseeing is visiting monuments or uh, what we call sites. It's actually the, the verb itself has the noun in it. I see the sites. So a site can be a monument. A site can be a statue. A site can be a historical area. Maybe there was a famous battle somewhere. Um, it's really a specific area of significance, usually of historical significance in that city. So in Algiers, if you go sightseeing, you would go see, um, you would go see the big monument, Makam Shahid, I think if I pronounce it correctly, you'd go see Notre Dame d'Afrique, right? You would go see the, the, the big church. You would go see probably the downtown area. You could walk around Didouche Murad. You would go see, what's another site? Ah, Tipaza, of course. You'd go to Tipaza, ah, Kasba. I'm not even thinking. The most obvious ones, Kasba and Tipaza, okay? These are sites. So when you go sightseeing, you are spending time, usually just one day, usually you hire a guide to go and look at famous areas or monuments in the city. Yeah, it's almost always historical sites. Well, historical or somehow, I mean, they can be newer, like a city invests in building a new monument, but they're very important to that city that you see. You wouldn't say I go sightseeing and you go to a mall, okay? A mall like a Garden City, that's not sightseeing. It's not a site, it's a mall, <laughs> okay? I saw someone say landmarks, it looks pretty, it, it's similar to landmarks. Okay, oh my gosh, it's almost eight o'clock, you guys. Okay, hire, what do we do for hire? Hire a guide, good. I saw someone say, can you say hire a hotel? We in the US never say this. It sounds so weird to me, but I know in the UK that you can hire a room. You guys, if you're going to London, you're gonna have to ask the Brits because to me, it sounds really wrong, but I know that they use hire to talk about physical spaces. I'm an American, I'm teaching you what I know, which is you hire people, you hire a guide, okay? Um, oh, I'm giving you the answers, lost. What is lost? Lost luggage. Ah, someone says, what does it mean to hire a guide? Well, we used this example earlier when we talked about booking a guide, but it means you, uh, you ask a guide to show you somewhere. Maybe you hire a guide who will show you the Casbah. They'll explain to you the different uh, history. They'll answer your questions in exchange for money. When you hire someone, you're paying the money. It's a service. So we might have some people in the call today who are in the class today who are uh, work for tourism companies and they provide guides. So in exchange for a certain amount of money per hour, they will send a guide to you. Okay, lost. What's lost? <laughs> lost in tourism. No. <laughs> I don't know if that was a joke about the movie Lost in Translation, but I was still laughing. Lost luggage, thanks. Lost luggage. This is how we talk about luggage that does not arrive off of the airplane. It's every traveler's nightmare. Lost luggage. Next we have off. Oops. Off season. Very good Khalid and Khalil, off season. What does it mean off season? Who can tell me? A period when there's less activity. Very good, Ayman. But what does it mean? How do we know it's off season? 
not in the high season, very good. So the high season is when it's very, very common to travel. So summer is a high season. It's a busy season. Everyone's on vacation. Kids are out of school. That is the biggest season. Off season would be after summer. So November to March is usually considered off season, but it depends. If you're in, if you're South Africa, your off season could be the opposite because you have winter and summer separate. So the season depends on the location. When you travel off season, you often have um, cheaper prices because there's less people competing for the same hotel rooms. That's off season. Okay, next we have pack. Pack, what are we packing? Pack a suitcase. We don't pack a deal. Nope, but we do pack a suitcase. Very good. Pack luggage. Yeah. Pack a suitcase. Pack a suitcase. Beautiful work, everyone. Pack a suitcase. Ah, the person who said pack deal. I think you were talking about package. Package. What do we say with package? Package deal. Very good. So pack a suitcase. Pack is the verb to pack, to put my clothes in a suitcase. Package, package deal, this is now an adjective. A package deal describes when you get two things, but you only pay once. So a hotel with excursions could be a package deal. Instead of paying 100,000 dinar, it's very expensive. Let's say instead of paying 30,000 dinar for the hotel and 10,000 dinar for excursions, that would be 40,000 total. They say to you, we'll give you everything for 35,000. You have a hotel for the week and the excursions. It's a package deal, okay? Fareed knows the phrase kit and caboodle. We don't have time to talk about that, Fareed, but I'm very impressed. That's a very uh, native English thing to contribute to the chat. <laughs> Yes, da, 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 I'm not sure how to pronounce your name. It's like an offer. What they say in French when they say an offer, we in English often call a package deal. But package deal has to be more than one thing. Okay, so it's a discount when you have multiple things. Okay, off. What's off? Off. Season, we have off season. Am I losing my mind? We already did off season. <laughs> I'm trying to go fast, but I'm, I'm slowing us down because I've mixed my order. Take, take. Oh, and I'm showing you the answer. You guys, this is what happens when I try to speed up. Everything gets confused. Okay, take the red eye or take a red eye. That I was really excited to show you. If you found the word red eye and you didn't know what it meant, that's totally fine. That's why we're doing tourism English vocabulary. A red eye is an overnight flight. It's a flight where it's taking place between any time in the evening, maybe six to 10 PM, and you travel overnight. You land the next day. That is called a red eye. So if you're traveling from, let's say you're going from Algeria to Canada, it's that seven hour flight. If you leave at 8 p.m. in Algeria and you land seven hours later in Canada, we call this a red eye flight, okay? I don't know the origin, but I imagine because when you're tired, your eyes get red. <laughs> and the red eye is, is understood to be uncomfortable. When people say, ah, I'm taking the red eye, you go, ooh, okay, like, I know you're not getting any sleep, okay? Um, to take a deal, that's not a tourism phrase. You take a deal is like if you're on a game show. Um, okay, what is next? Travel, travel, travel guide, travel agent. Very good. I think I just put travel agent, travel guide. Mm, I don't love travel guide. We say tour guide, tour guide and travel agent tour guide, travel agent, okay? And the very last one, I think you can already see it in front of you, but I'll pretend we haven't all looked. 
Weekend, weekend getaway. Good job, everybody. A weekend getaway. What does it mean, weekend getaway? Weekend getaway. Okay, I'm in says it's a period of time when we want to relax. But what does it mean, getaway? A getaway is a specific length of time. Weekend trip. Very good for read. A getaway is a, oh, it already said weekend. I was thinking that you realized for me to, it had to be short. A getaway is a short trip. Okay. So it doesn't have to be weekend, but it needs to be short. So if you say to someone, we're just having a getaway in Tunis, it means just a few days. And it has the, the idea of being um, last minute and kind of like romantic, like an old movie. I just need to have a getaway. And it's, it, it's in the word itself, like get me away from my life. I just need some distance. I'm having a getaway in Constantine. So it's a, a weekend or a shorter time and usually describes like a sense of leaving behind your work and your, your, busy, your busy life, okay? I'm realizing we are almost at the end, you guys. So we are going to have to cut some of this short, but just to finish collocations, tell me, I found 22. Did anyone find more than me? Did anyone find more? Oh, I see you guys asking for the recordings. The recordings will be on our YouTube page and the embassy's YouTube page. I suppose we should post these in the chat. Marwa, if you have the link, go ahead and post it. So, we were going to do skill development. I'm going to save this for next week. This is going to be all about polite English. In the tourism industry, we need to have a polite level of English. So this is for next week. Look at how much I thought we'd get through. And you know what is so sad is I had so many opportunities for you guys to talk and join on mic, but this hat, you know, halas, the first session, I had to do a lot of explaining and talking. Next week, we will have way more um, participation, I hope. Hi, Farid, I see you on there. Idiom of the week, the last thing before we leave, I give you guys every week an idiom. This is a common expression that uh, doesn't, it's non-literal. It, it's different than the actual meaning of the words. Today, I'm, I'm teaching you tourist trap, a place that attracts tourists, but charges a lot of money and it's not a good place to go. And to travel light, which means to travel with a small suitcase. It's only a weekend trip. We packed light. That's everything I have for you guys. Thank you so much for being an amazing first group. I'm so happy. We had 500 the whole time. We never went below 500. I'm so touched and honored to be your teacher this evening. And we have much more to do. I hope to see you guys next Tuesday night where we will keep doing everything and anything related to tourism English. I'm sorry we didn't have the link for the YouTube, but you know what? I'll try to share it out uh, either on my Instagram or on, um, maybe we can email everyone who registered. We can try to email everyone who registered, but I'll put in here my Instagram. If you guys wanna look there, I'll share it there as well. I'm at Ariella in Algeria. Thank you everyone. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you for the nice words. Have an amazing evening.